Okay, Ephesians 4, and then a few other places, obviously. Ephesians 4, 17. Okay, let's go ahead and pray. Lord, I do ask you to help us to understand your words, and I do ask that you'd help us to understand uh, the plan that you have for everyone. Uh, unfortunately, the vast majority do not accept it, and I do pray that the ones have accepted it, uh, that we would rejoice in it, that would be happy about it, we'd be uh, appreciative and grateful people. Help us to understand uh, the truth this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, Ephesians 4, 17. Okay, what Paul is doing here in verse 17, he's going to describe uh, 99% of the people that you walk by in the store or on the job or things like that. This is how people are living today, Ephesians 4, verse 17. So he says, This I say therefore and testify in the Lord that ye... Ye, this would be the Ephesians, henceforth walk not as, as other Gentiles walk. Okay, so how do most people live their lives? In the vanity of their mind. That's how most people live their lives. It's all about me. It's all, everything revolves around me. Uh, no different than an animal. Most people live no different than an animal. And how does an animal live? Self-preservation. Self-propagation, self-gratification. That's how most people live. Self-gratification, oh, I'm too hot, so I need to cool down. I'm too cold. I'm hungry. Oh, I'm tired. Okay, self-gratification, self-propagation. Well, I've got to keep the species going. And self-preservation. That's how animals live. Survive the fittest. Unfortunately, that's how most people live. And he says, in the vanity of their mind. Then says, having the understanding darkened. Understanding of what? Understanding of God. It's darkened. God has faded away in their thoughts. Being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them. Because of the blindness of their heart. Who, being past feeling, how they live? By their feelings who being past feeling have given themselves over unto lasciviousness, big word, for any fleshly desire, to work all uncleanness with greediness, but ye have not so learned Christ. So he's offering a different, uh, an alternative plan than what most people live. Okay, so verse 16, 7, or 17, 18, 19, that's how most people live. Okay, and he is offering something different in verse 20, but ye have not so learned Christ. So, if you would go to 1 Timothy chapter 2, this is God's plan, his desire, his goal for every single person at the moment they are born into this world. This is God's ultimate goal, but the thing is, is he is not going to force this on anybody it's this, this is his desire. 1 Timothy 2, verse 3. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who will have all men to be saved. Now, is that it? No, saved, comma, and to come unto the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God and one, uh, one man, or mediator, between God and men, the man Christ Jesus. We'll see that everything goes through Christ Jesus. Who gave himself a ransom for all to be testified in due time. Now, did you pick up on that word testified twice now? Okay, and there's a reason for that. Okay, God, that's his plan, verse 4, for every single person. But the vast majority of people are living in the vanity of their mind. Okay, with the cell phones and the mead movement and Facebook, I mean, there is the obvious evidence of that. 
Everything's built around me, me, everything's about me, all things work around me, and that's life. You know, everybody's about me, me. That's how people are, okay, especially in this age. Now, God's plan is that he has a plan for all, that they can have life in eternity, and when they have that set, then life on earth becomes more value. When they know where eternity is, life on earth becomes more of a value. You know the number three killer right now of teenagers, the third leading cause of death, is suicide. A teenage kid looks at the mess that he's living in and said, ain't worth it. And he takes his life out. Okay, and why? It's because his parents are living the vanity of life. And then they will, how far they go, they'll mistreat that child or whatnot. And so the child's like, okay, what's the use? I'm checking out of here. There is a different plan. God has a different plan, but God will not force his plan on anybody. He offers the plan, but a person has to voluntarily accept it. So the plan uh, has lawful aspects because God is the only true monarch. Okay, so I'm going to run through the salvation. For people who are saved, hopefully you just enjoy it more. Realize the bigness of it. Uh, one time, uh, the Lord, or a few times, the Lord sent the apostles out. One of the first times, they came back, and they were so excited. They said, Lord, the spirits are subject to us. And he's like, soul? He said, rejoice because your name is written in heaven. That's something you can rejoice about. So is your name written in heaven? Okay, and that's the thing. So the Bible, a lot of people think, look at the Bible and they, they, they swallow the deception that it's a religious book. Okay, and that, that is a, that's a misnomer. Uh, the Bible is actually a law book because the potentate, the monarch, has given a law book to us because he is the king. He's the king of kings. Now, that's, that's kind of unusual for a lot of people. Back in 1999, I started hosting law classes where we had a gentleman from Wisconsin would come down and we'd get, assemble a group of people and he would teach law class, American law, anything to deal with American law for two straight weeks, so eight, uh, ten days, Five days, we did it Monday through Friday, eight hours, we sat and listened to this man. I hosted that six times. So we learned American law, we learned a lot of things that attorneys don't know about. And even, uh, I've been, you know, involved in some court situations, and, you know, people will see, and they say, are you a, an attorney? And my answer is always the same, I've been accused but never convicted. And the look on their face was like, oh. <laughs> Even got charged years ago from the unauthorized practice of law. But at, in that process of learning these things, I realized this book is a law book. Now, Paul himself, before he got saved, was highly educated, okay, and he, and he know, knew Roman law. In fact, he might have been some type of a lawyer in that day. The Apostle Paul. In Acts chapter 16, he got arrested unjustly. And then he got beat while he was in jail unjustly. And when the uh, civil authorities of Rome discovered, oh, we need to get rid of this guy. He basically took his law knowledge and scared them to death because he could have thrown them in jail for kidnapping him, unjust arrest, unjust um, beating of him. He was condemned without a trial. And they, got, they were scared to death in Acts chapter 16. He could have done that. But he just let it slide. He knew something. And those guys were afraid of that. And when you start going through some of his writings, you're going to discover there are legal terms that he uses to describe salvation. Many of these terms will be a big word, and it will end in I-O-N. 
Those are words that are not taught to believers today. The church is dumbed down just like the public schools are dumbed down. And people know nothing about the true doctrines of the Bible. And so I'm going to run through some of that. And in the process, maybe you will discover, first off, if you're saved, that, man, what a, what a big deal it is what God has done. And if a person's not, you can realize there's a great offer that's offered to you free. Absolutely free. Okay, and so uh, if you would look in Galatians chapter 3, how, have you ever heard people say, well, we're all children of God? You ever hear somebody say that? We're all children of God. Uh, they get that out of Galatians 3, verse 26. Well, we're all children of God. And if they're real highbrow, they'll say God. You know, they've got to really say that fancy. They get this out of Galatians chapter 3, verse 26. For The statement reads very clearly, For ye are all the children of God. Now, if it said period, no problem. But they didn't read the rest of the verse. It's like a guy in court, was, he was uh, charged with theft, and he told the judge, uh, uh, Judge, I, the Bible tells me to, do, to steal. It says in Ephesians 4, Let him that stole steal. It does say that. It was a direct quotation, but he didn't read the rest of the sentence. Let him that stole steal no more. So when people say, we're all children of God, if there was a period there, I would say, I agree with you. But there's not a period there. It says, by faith in Christ Jesus. That's the key. By faith in Christ Jesus. Okay, if you would, if you're in Galatians, go to Ephesians. Where are most people? Okay, a person is a child of God by faith in Christ Jesus. Not by faith in your faith. It's faith in Christ Jesus. Okay, so a, per, a baby is born. Baby's infant. Okay, the infant starts growing, becomes a child. Okay, there comes a time in that individual's life that they recognize knowledge of good and evil. It varies for everybody, depends on what they've been taught, what they were raised, how they were raised. In many cases, it might be 12. Some folks tend to feel it's around 12 because that's when Jesus was 12 years old teaching in the Jewish temple. And in many cases, I would dare say that's probably true. Depending on their upbringing, if a person is uh, raised with absolutely nothing, it might be a little older. If somebody's raised with some Bible teaching, it might be five or six. It's when that individual recognizes the knowledge of sin. Sin meaning, I'm first, self, I'm before God, whatnot. When a person recognizes that knowledge, then they're held accountable. So every infant Every child before that knowledge of good and evil is safe in Jesus Christ. I don't say saved, but they're safe in Jesus Christ. So when they die, they go to heaven. Now some folks think you've got to put some H2O upon them, and for some reason that a couple of droplets of H2O is going to give them that ticket to heaven. Go get somebody else. Okay, they're safe in Jesus Christ. Okay, there were uh, a neighbor of ours, they had two children die in a fire, and you go past the farm and the first house on the right, you'll see that that house is a brick building, a brick house, but the brick was the bricks from the house that burned down. And they rebuilt that house the way they felt. Okay, because they had two children die in a fire. Somebody else in the area, their child died in a fire, and, and they did not, quote, get their, their child infant baptized, and somebody had the audacity to tell them, your child went to hell because of that. Uh, go kid somebody else. No, a, a child that has no knowledge of good and evil, the Bible gives the record that there is no charge against them. So they're safe in Jesus Christ. Now, 
when that child recognizes good from evil, not right from wrong, but good from evil, that's a different standard. Okay, what they do is they lose that safeness in Jesus Christ. And Ephesians 2 says, verse 22, they become a child of disobedience. They are disobeying like Adam and Eve disobeyed. They are now a child of disobedience. And then it says in verse 3, a child of wrath or children of wrath. Wrath meaning under the wrath of God because they are going further and further and further down this path of disobedience. That's where the majority of people are today. They are children of wrath, children of disobedience. And the Lord just lets it go. Okay, so what happens is that when they violate their conscience, because God has placed in the heart of every single person that conscience, and as parents, you know that when your kids are really, really quiet, something is going on. Okay, and their conscience is saying, Mom, Dad is not, wouldn't be real happy with what you're doing, so let's talk real quiet. What's giving them that warning is that conscience. See, now the Lord, at, at that moment, when that child transfers to a child of disobedience or, or further down the road, a child of wrath, God wants to bring them that plan that he has. So he personally works on every single person. He's been working on them ever since that time. John 1, 9 says that God has lighted the heart of every man. And then he has a second testimony of this creation out here. That's a second testimony. No, there was not uh, nothing years ago, eons, and nothing didn't explode to become something. I mean, that is not, a, not scientifically insane. Just absolutely insane. So creation is evidence of a creator. That's a second witness. And then the Lord will throw in a third witness where somebody will witness to them or tell them. Maybe a parent will tell them something. Okay, maybe a friend will say something. Okay, that is another witness. Now, when they have violated their conscience, their conscience becomes defiled, and it like there's a void that occurs there. There's an emptiness. There's a void inside. And that's that conscience the limitation on our conscience is it tells us when we've done something wrong because we violated a law, we've offended our God, but the conscience doesn't tell us what's right to do. That's where this book comes in play. So they have this emptiness. Now, a lot of people will fill that emptiness with religion. And their conscience is appeased temporarily by religion. Or they'll try to drown it out by the music, by the affairs of this life. They get in the car and they'll turn the radio on. They'll go this and turn this on. They got this and turn this on. Why? Because they don't like silence. When things get quiet and when they get lonely, that's when the Lord steps in and he starts speaking to them. But you can drown out the Lord. They drown them out by the affairs of this life. And in moments of lowliness and quietness, then the Spirit will revisit that conscience and enlighten them and enlighten them and enlighten them. And the Lord is gently trying to pull them to himself, to his great plan that he has offered to them. If you would look at Romans chapter 1. Now I'm going to run through the epistle of Rome uh, to the Romans and I'm going to run through it chronologically, and we're going to look at some of those legal terms that end in I-O-N. These big words that people often overlook. Okay, so he summarizes it right off the bat, Romans 1.16. He says, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. There's that, a big word, salvation. To everyone that believeth to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So notice what's connected with salvation is the gospel of Christ and believing. Salvation, 
That's a legal term. It's to be delivered, to be delivered from sin and consequences. If somebody's out in the water drowning, yelling and screaming, somebody saves them by delivering them from drowning. So salvation is the big over-encompassing word of the whole plan. Then there's little details as we come through here, and we're going to see terms that apply in the legal realm. Okay, the next one chronologically is Romans 3.24. Romans 3.24. And what we're going to do is, after a person is saved, if they go back to the Bible and they see the bigness of it, then you sit back and say, wow, what a gift. And I was arrogant enough to think that I had to throw baptism in on this? Or my good works? Are you kidding me? So in verse 24, being justified freely by his grace through the, notice, redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Redemption, that's a legal term. Okay, if you... If you're short on money and you're in a panic or whatnot, you can take an item to a pawn shop. Okay, you give them the item and then they give you a pretty low amount for the item. Okay, and then you take that money out and you supplied some things you needed. And maybe your house, maybe things worked out better for you and that item is still at the pawn shop. And so you take the money back to the pawn shop and you can redeem your item. Buy it back. Buy it back. Redemption. That's what that is. Redemption. Why would God need to buy me back? Well, when I was a child, before I understood knowledge of good and evil, I was safe in the arms of Jesus. But then, when I discovered good from evil, I transferred myself to a child of disobedience. And further down that road, I maybe became a child of wrath, and the Lord wants to buy me back. Boy, that's a, that's a deal. The next verse says, Whom God hath set forth to be a propitiation. Big word. What's that mean? Get a dictionary. Look it up. That's how you expand your knowledge. But notice propitiation is through faith. Not faith, just plain old faith. In his blood to declare his righteousness for the remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. Okay, propitiation, what's that mean? That means to regain the favor of. Okay, I, you see, as a child, when I discovered good from evil and I chose the route of evil, I became a child of disobedience, I fell out of God's favor. So he wants to buy me back. And when he buys me back, then I'm back in his favor. Propitiation. It's a legal term. Okay, and then the next one, as you keep marching through uh, Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Okay, the next one is, he says, Therefore, being justified by water, justified by faith, we have peace with God. Why? Because I was at enmity against him. I have peace with God through the Baptist church. Methodist, Pentecostal, you know, Latter-day Saints. No, it's through Jesus Christ. Justification. Look at the word justification. Justice. Judge. Jury. Jurisdiction. These are all legal terms. What is justification? Well, if a person justifies themselves, they're trying to make themselves clean. But here it's done by Jesus Christ. It's done by him, justification. And with that, if you drop down to verse 10, there's another word. And it says, for if when we were enemies, we were reconciled. To God by the death of his son. Much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Reconciled, but the big word is reconciliation. 
That's when two parties were at odds and then somebody stepped in and tried to get these two parties to come together. They are reconciled. Well, who gets us to come together, God or man? The one man, Jesus Christ. He reconciles. Reconciliation. Legal term. Keep going, chapter 8. This one is pretty well understood. This one pretty much everybody's going to know is adoption. Romans 8, verse 15. For ye have not received the spirit of adoption again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption whereby we cry, Abba, Father. It's a Hebrew way of saying Daddy. For the Spirit itself bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. How are we are the children of God? By faith in Christ Jesus. When Jan and I served, lived in Colorado Springs, we worked with the youth there, and in the youth group we had three kids, three teenagers that were adopted. Okay, and they kind of had a standing rule with the other kids. They said, ah, psh, the Lord, your parents were stuck with you. Ours chose us. That's a pretty good way to look at it. And the same is true. Why? I was a child of disobedience, a child of wrath, and God chose me, and I got adopted. But the, the child, when they're old enough, they have to approve of the adoption. When they're old enough, they got to put their say-so in the thing. Okay, and the same is true in life. I make that choice. Yes, I want to be adopted by you, Jesus Christ. Okay, that's a legal term. It's, it's a legal act to accept and nurture a child of another. As a result of my sin, I was a child of another, a child of disobedience, a child of wrath, which ultimately becomes a child of Satan. I am a child of another, and Jesus Christ gave an official act where he's going to accept and nurture me as his own child. This is a gift that's given by repentance toward God and faith toward our Lord Jesus Christ. That's what adoption's all about. Now, there's three words that usually anybody that's been saved for a long time knows that there's three, those three words, justification, and then there's another sanctification. Then there's glorification. All words that end in I-O-N. In Romans 5.1, I've already hit that, where justification is a legal decree of righteousness. Okay, so when I chose good for evil from good, I became a child of disobedience. God is keeping records. The angels got their cameras on me. They're watching, so they're keeping records. Got the name up at the top and all the sins are listed down through there. Okay, and so I, at the moment I placed my faith in Jesus Christ, an angel hit the control A button, which highlighted all the sins, and he hit the delete button. And then he wrote across it, righteousness of God. It's a legal act. You know, if, if you saw my record in heaven, it says him, righteousness of God, and then you saw me down here and said, something's not right here. We're not seeing that part of it. And God says, well, you're not looking from the heavenly perspective. That's the gift. That's the free gift. You see, God is holy and God is just. And he keeps accurate records. And he keeps his records because a man's going to have to give an account of himself to God. And he's going to bring it up. And so justification takes place by faith. In Jesus Christ. Now, if you would, if you're still in Romans 8, look at 8, 829. Okay, and this one says, For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate. Big word, predestination. A lot of times the English word, if you split it up, you'll see what the meaning. Predestinate, destination. Destin oh, I know what a destination is. Okay, Jan and I have tickets to go to Costa Rica in November to see Brenton family. Our destination is Costa Rica. Right now it's a predestination because we're not in Costa Rica. It's a beforehand destination. So I bought the tickets and we are predestinated to go to Costa Rica. Okay, and so 
my predestination here, according to this, is to be conformed to the image of his son. That's the predestination. I'm going to be like Jesus Christ someday. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he did predestinate, them he also called. And whom he called, them he also justified. And whom he justified, them he also glorified. Okay, now notice, justified and glorified, he skipped, he skipped sanctified. What is that? Justified, glorified. Okay, justified is a one-time act. That is birth, a one-time act. The guarantee in the Bible is when a man is justified, he will be glorified. What's glorified? That means glorified is when he is in heaven or at the millennial uh, kingdom with Jesus Christ. Because Jesus Christ said, if you're born again, you will see the kingdom of God. You will enter the kingdom of God. That's the guarantee. That's an automatic Justified, sanctified, uh, glorified. That's eternal security. In 1 Peter 1 4, it says you have a reservation reserved in heaven. Amen. It's reserved. You call the restaurant beforehand, and so and so's coming at this time, you got a reservation. Okay, so what do you do? You call Jesus Christ and trusted in him, and now you got your name written in the Lamb's Book of Life, and you got a reservation. Now, we can make that reservation better. Okay, glorification, one time, or sanctify, I'm sorry, justification, one time act, birth. Glorification, at the moment of death, one time act, like Jesus Christ. One time act. In that middle part is sanctification. It's a legal term. Sanctuary cities. Okay, a sanctuary. It's a room that's set apart. To sanctify, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, we got to jump over there for this one. 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11. Okay, these people that he's writing to formerly, before they got saved, they were, verse 9, fornicators, idolaters, adulterers, effeminate, abusers of themselves with mankind, thieves, covetous, drunkards, revilers, extortioners, pretty bad crowd. And then it says, and such were some of you, but ye are washed, but ye are sanctified, but ye are justified in the name of the Lord Jesus and by the Spirit of our God. Okay, sanctified, what is that? Okay, justified is a one-time act birth. Sanctified is growth. And then at the moment of death, you're at the departure gate. At the departure gate, the Bible likens death to departure because the soul leaves the body. So at the departure gate, there's tears of sorrow. At the arrival gate in heaven, there's tears of joy. Okay, so that's a one-time deal. Okay, and then you go out into eternity, life after death. Okay, now that will give value to life before death. That's that sanctified. That's when a civilian, when a civilian joins the military, the civilian decides, I'm going to join the military. He signs a contract. He is a one-time act. He is a soldier. Now they've got to train him to be a soldier. When he signed that contract, at, right at that moment, he ceases to be a civilian. He is a soldier. Then he's sent into basic training. That's the sanctification. He is set apart. He has a special uniform. You know, and he's trained all these special things. He's sanctified. Okay? And so it's a one-time act, but the sanctification is a growth. It's a process. Citizenship, where a person is born as a citizen, then they elect them for a service. That's sanctification. Now, when we have justification, one-time deal, sanctification, that part right there makes the glorification better. Justification determines our destiny. Sanctification determines our inheritance when we get to the destiny. You know, if we get on an airplane, okay, and our destination for everybody that got on that airplane is the same location. 
A lot of people go to church and they ask the pilot, the pastor, whoever, what, does he know for sure where he's going when he dies? And most of them don't know. Why would you get in an airplane like that? Go to the airport, say, you're, looking to, you're walking into the plane, you look to the left and say, Captain, where are we going? Well, I don't know. What? Well, I don't know. Okay, I'm getting off. But that's where most people are at. They walk down front and ask the guy, do you know for sure you're going to heaven? Oh, nobody knows that. I'm going someplace where the guy knows. So, now, if we get on that airplane and we abide by the rules of the airline, when we get to our destination, we're going to be happy. But what if a person is naughty on the airplane and they make a scene? When they get to their destination, they're getting there. There might be a copper there ready to take them someplace. Now, they got to the same destination, but they didn't, uh, they didn't make it so good. Why they didn't abide by the rules set up by the airline. And so the Lord has these rules. A lot of believers are going to get to their destination, but they're going to, there might be a, an angel dressed as a copper. And it's just not going to be so happy for them right off the bat. You see, the, the sanctification is God has invested his plan in every single person. And sanctification, when we meet that obligation, we are giving God a return on his investment. A lot of people, you deal with them, especially down south, you witness them, well, I'm saved. Okay, okay, good, I'm happy for you, I'm saved. Is that all you got for it? Well, I'm saved. I, you already said that twice, okay? I mean, are you gonna? Are you giving anything back to God? Well, I'm saved. Okay, I'm happy for you. Uh, well, uh, you ought to be giving something back to God. I mean, isn't that a little bit of gratitude? One time, I was on an airplane. I was, you know, in the in the usual where we're at, the cabin section. You know, you don't want to get way in the back because then you got the odor of the bathroom all the time. But oh, wait, way in the cabin section. And so right before the plane's getting ready to take off, I get called to the front. You know, Dave Hoffman, please come to the front. So I go to the front. And I said, we had to have your seat and gave it to somebody else. I said, okay. And he said, I, we think you'll like your seat. And I saw, ooh, number three. Ooh, I got first class without paying for it. Man, when you're in the coach and you're up in first class, that's pretty high class. Man, you don't want to go to sleep up there because you get all these luxury, all this food, man. You gain about 10 pounds, right, depending on how long the flight is. But boy, was it a nice flight. And you know, this lady sat right next to me, got the same treatment and everything. She gets off the plane and she gripes to the stewardess like, that's the worst flight I've ever been on. I thought, what an ingrate. Why? She lives in the vanity of her mind. That's where she's living. Very dissatisfied person very frustrated person, should have been happy, should have been happy with that, should have appreciated that, you know, and the thing is, is the Lord has justification, one time act, sanctification, that's our flight, we can pay back to God, you know, we can give God some dividends by living as he wants us to live, where we are seeking to be like Christ before the glorification where we're, boom, automatically like Christ, where it's not such a shock from there. And, you know, the Lord in heaven kind of sort of said, when he invests in a person like that, he, that's good. That's gratitude. That's a joy that a person has. Wow, I got a reservation in heaven. Man, thank God for that. And it's a free gift? Are you serious? And it's legalized and it's signed and sealed in the court of heaven. My name's written in the Lamb's Book of Life and it's all free. Wow. I want to pay him back some. I'll never, I'm always going to be a debtor to him, but I'm going to, I'm going to live according to this book the best I can. I'm going to try to tell others about this great deal. Man, can't get anything better than that. You see, that's the bigness of it. And how dare somebody throw their good works in on that. 
How arrogant do they think they are? Jesus Christ died and paid it all. And all to him I owe. It's a free gift. We've got to thank God for what he's done. Okay, let's go ahead and pray. Lord, I do pray you'd help us to appreciate the offer, the plan that you have for everyone. But sadly, sadly, so few accept it. And also, sadly, many that have accepted it, justified, have taken it for granted and are not living sanctified, not trying to give back to thee a portion of what you have done. Lord, I thank you for that, and I pray that you'd help folks who are saved that we would appreciate it. We'd see the bigness of it, and we'd be happily to tell others about it. Well, heads about and eyes are closed. If you've never trusted Jesus Christ, Okay, the offer is available. It's full and free. It's trusting him, turning towards him, and recognizing he's paid it all. If you've never done that, and you'd see your need of that, you know, just see anybody, and they'll get you to somebody to show you how you can sign that deal with Jesus Christ and then be justified. And you have the promise of glorified, and you've got a reservation in heaven already set. You've got your name set and signed. And then, and then, hopefully, from here on out to the day you die, we try to pay something back to them. That's sanctified. We try to live a holy life. We try to keep short accounts with God. We, we try to get our conscience in a, in a good order again. And we read this book and try to agree with some things that God has said. Try to be a blessing to God. The piano will play if you'd like to use the altar. It's open for you. The thing is, is it's so simple. It's so simple. That man in his self-righteousness always wants to add something to it. Which nullifies the entire plan. Thank God for his wonderful plan for everybody. Thank you for our great plan. Thank you for your great love. But it's too bad. It's just so bad, sad that so many people don't accept that love. And I just pray you'd help us to recognize the bigness of salvation, what it really is, full and free in Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen.